both of these teams is a whole lot of aggression. So what better battleground to go to than Battlefield of Eternity, an old favorite of Octalysis, one of the oldest to go to Battlefield of Eternity. They have shown a penchant for team fighting, but no tomorrow have too. So we could be in for a good old fashioned brawl, j -Hal. Could be in for more triple melee. That time we saw, the last time I believe we saw Octalysis on this, they ran the Hammer, Hammer the Main Comp. Mm -hmm. And it was not very well protected. I believe that was against Tempo Storm and Tempo Storm, whoever they were facing, just ran right into them and dared them to fire back. I don't know if we'll see, see the same style of composition. Li Ming likely on either side of the battleground. It's just with Genji now 0 for 2 on the side of No Tomorrow, are they willing to commit to that if it does make it through the ban phase again? We know who I don't think is making it through the ban phase, Hanzo. Ooh, especially now Certainly with these bans, there's no way possible you can let Hanzo through. No Tomorrow has yet to play on Battlefield of Eternity, but being that it was Octalysis' battleground choice and we know that it's a favored one of them. No Tomorrow had to have the idea that they would eventually be here should they get to the later stages of the series. Is it a Rainer ban? Rainer's something to consider too. Uh, though yeah. we have seen a Rainer on Battlefield of Eternity. It's still tricky. Sure. Rainer does great in skirmishes. Actually has marginally decent wave clear now with give him some pepper. But race potential, he's still average. And in an open arena around those immortals, still gonna get the ban. Does lack the mobility, but it doesn't matter as he's gonna be banned out there. So any diving heroes that could potentially get on him, doesn't matter. Where does Genji fall? Where does Hanzo fall? I would guess that No Tomorrow will leave Hanzo up for Octalysis to ban. It is a solid first pick option on Battlefield of Eternity. And they do. They take out Ural. Octalysis, when they ran that Sergeant Hammer Lee Ming, they also ran it with the Murden Ural. And the problem with that was trying to get no or Tempo Storm to engage in range of Sergeant Hammer, but regardless, it, it is not going to be available for them as No Tomorrow takes Ural away. And there is the Hanzo ban. Due to the amount of melee that we've seen Octalysis run a lot of, there's going to be the Genji. I wonder if this might be a Tyrael game that we get from Goku and just run a, another melee assassin on the front line there. I think that would come later in the draft if it mm -hmm. did show up. Phoenix, we've seen be very impactful for Octalysis in this series. And Alex. Alex Phoenix. Alex Lee Ming. Wow. I expected her to show up potentially early, given that Shrite, we've seen him in, in the past on Lee Ming. This is a decent Lee Ming battleground. I did not anticipate it being this high up, though, for Octalysis. Another hero to keep in mind now that Hanzo's gone for the race would be Greymane, possibly on e either team. No Tomorrow going to stick with their Malfury, and they also take Muradin away out of the hands of uh, Justing. Very well-rounded first three picks for No Tomorrow. If there's one role to isolate for Octalysis, it'll be the solo. And as we see on Battlefield of Eternity, though, it's important to have those heroes who can move back and forth between the lanes. There's just so much brawling that happens in the center of the map. Feeling Blaze if they're going to go Tyrael. Chromie ban on Battlefield of Eternity. Chromie Genji is all team fight, not a lot of race. Mm -hmm. No Tomorrow with their draft last game was very much into the single target blow up department. That's not going to be available, at least with the Chromie Genji composition. Let's see what else they might pull out. ETC ban. ETC does gain some value on Battlefield of Eternity because it's so easy to lock people down on the Immortal stuns. Though he's still a target for the kind of composition that No Tomorrow is building into. Octalysis 
and Endemic both showed liking ETC for either the solo lane and the global or for the tank. But here, they're going to go back into it, uh, Jhao. I don't know why I forgot your name for a second. It's OK. <laughs> it's totally fine, Trixie. So I'm really curious. Just riddle me this, because this is not a common hero. It's not something we've seen Justin play this phase. But I'm thinking we might see a variant, depending on what comes in here. Now that it's the gray main, I think probably not. We've seen an Arthas show up before as well. But I think, I think does need, yeah. play a lot of, he used to play a lot of Arthas. I think you need some point and click CC to deal with the Genji though. Mm. What are you liking then? Um, Garrosh? Garrosh seems excellent here. We or Diablo. Slams. Double dragon, kind of, between Diablo and Alexstrasza. He looks kind of like a dragon. I know he's a demon, but really that's the fire comp, is what we should call that. Alexstrasza, Blaze, and Diablo. But that is a, a bunch of beefy frontliners to keep the Sergeant Hammer safe, and then Sergeant Hammer and Li Ming to keep the shelling out going. And this time it's not versus the Hanzo. And last time that composition was versus the Hanzo, which could outrace very quickly on Immortals. How are you feeling about this? Is it enough for Octalysis? The Diablo does answer into the Genji particularly well. The Swift Strike onto a Hammer, we know where that comes in. Bringing the hammer is going to be that of Murd and diving in on that. And Life Finder, we've seen have pretty significant value for that single target save. The Grey Main, obviously, is a big X factor in this game to give you that race potential. But obviously, the kill threat does do well. Curse Bullet into Diablo. Mm -hmm. I think we might be seeing a little bit of go for the throat action, though. Life Binder with Diablo should get mega value. <laughs> We're doing it. We're going to Battlefield of Eternity, my personal favorite map, for the fourth and potentially final game of this first series of HGC today. Justin on Diablo. It's not something we see too, too often. But on Battlefield of Eternity, we know a lot of teams, especially around the fight zone, so to speak. There's a lot of terrain that you can find targets. And I think he'll be having his eyes firmly set on the cybernetic ninja known as Genji. Well, Battlefield of Eternity doesn't offer as consistent globe usage as we see with some of the other battlegrounds in the HGC map pool. As such, Justin was considering what he wanted to pick up for his level one. He still ends up getting Devil's Due, and of course it does give you more healing, not just out of region globes, but also the healing fountains, but there were some other sustainable um, options. Sometimes we see Feast on Fear very occasionally here in NA, and if he's hoping to maybe even build into a devastating charge later on with a second shadow charge and just trying to get a lot of stuns around for more control over Node tomorrow, and then also get the healing from that. I think we that's probably what he was deciding between, though. We've even seen the uh, Soul Shield every once in a while here in NA. I would have liked that. It's something that we've seen adapted to at times. This has clearly been more meta, but the Feast on Fear lineup, mm -hmm. something that we do see teams run at time. But right now, Prismat and team, they're going to continue to siege up. With Greymane at the top and not showing bottom, this is only a Hanzo and Murden to deal with the wave clear, which is not easy. And so they're going to continue to siege up and there's no real threat. The Swift Strike is fine, but this early, there is not much damage coming out. Yeah, Greyman needs to run here as fast as his dog legs can carry him, or mount legs, or none, since it's a cloud. Here we go. Love this rotation, and then the setup from that too with the roots, but Prismatis is in fine for the moment. Another Stormbolt, long range from Jin. Hits him at the end of that. But Prismaticism survives. He will go ahead and back. And now Goku's left to try to deal with the Cosra camp. Something that you see fairly often when you do get Grey Main on this battleground is the sneaky rotation up to help the solo laner out by getting the camp. And now having the Grey Main in the bottom and forcing back Prismaticism. No, tomorrow's not going to get just one Cosra camp, but a second. 
the the gray main rotation down. The first minion wave and kind of poke a little bit is the difference between not having a gray main in your four man and having a gray main in your four man. And I think that's a lot more threatening now. See Shrite, he's back in with basically full health, full mana. Imagine he's going to be heading over to that Shaman camp. Yes. As Octalis is, they're going to sit on theirs, remember, at 30 seconds out. Mm. A lot of teams will start to look towards capping this, but generally that 10 to 15 second window is where we see a lot of pros hit. Jin was checking on it. Sometimes you can scare your opponents into capping that slightly earlier, just from the fear the of that. The old noblesse scare. Uh -huh. Especially <laughs> with the Tyrael, which for a long time that was happening in Korea. You see a Tyrael around who has holy ground, and you're like, oh crap, we better cap this before he steals it away from us. There's been a lot. I remember old school Murden was a little bit more intimidating than he is now, and Murden would just show up, and he'd be like, oh god, no. And he'd walk away from stuff. Justin, speaking of Murden, man, nice stun directly oh, into the, the immortal stun. Shrite is going to go down, set up there by Justin. That is why Diablo can be so terrifying. That is going to be first blood. This is the beautiful flexibility that Octalysis does have their back line that drated on that Li Ming just as potent to follow that up there for the charge and the uh, damage right to after the fact. And now for a few seconds of Greyman being gone, Octalysis is going to siege up and get this halfway point so they can get a lot safer. You see Prismaticism use that siege tactics now that he has picked up his level four talent. The halfway point has been started and now no tomorrow are left with some hard choices. With Greymane being your clear racing hero and also one of your better damage dealers, it will be difficult and Hammer just sits behind that wall and just drops bombs over and over again. Nice roots are gonna zone Justine out for now. Gonna get the flip back on to Tomster Thompson trying to make it out of here alive. Swift Strike in return. That's going to be the first to fall, but Jin and team, they've got their eyes on Buds. Forces out the Dragon Queen. Dragon Queen, then you get the increased health from that, the healing too. And Drayden's getting lots of health because he does take dominance, and he is getting resets. With those three kills, Octalysis get a half-shielded Immortal, and this is already night and day different from the last time they tried to run this Lee Ming at Sergeant Hammer, especially if they can get a staggered death like this going. If you are a tank player, you are setting up your ranged assassin. If you are an assassin player, you are waiting for your tank to set it up. The patience at the competitive level versus your standard hero league level. That Malfurion, his health bar went down so fast just due to the patience, the setup. And right now, Octalysis is clicking on all cylinders. They siege up with this immortal. Shield has fallen. Fort will fall momentarily. See how much they can try and get done. Chen wants to dive in for Prismaticism, but the retreat point is that they have that abundance there. But still is almost dead. No Tomorrow gets a welcome kill as they force back Octalysis, but not before that fort falls. And the Immortal still pretty healthy. Moving on to the Keep Towers. That'll start to be cleared up faster now as we're going to have a pause momentarily. Oh, yeah. I mean, just real smoothly uh, <laughs> go in there. But... For what we just saw, the other thing that we'll take a look at when we do get back into that game was they committed a lot to that kill. They only got the one kill, and you have to ask yourself, is it worth it? And the reason why you have to ask yourself that is because Blaze was down there just pumping some jet flames over and over, just clearing out that bot lane, even doing some structure damage. That was kind of where we left off on that rotation back down. Right. So we'll look at that going back in. At this level, is the kill actually, does it outweigh missing minion waves? Not even just one minion wave, but multiple potential minion waves. And then beyond that, structure damage, which the Immortal, if it does, the next one comes in at this point and everything looks the same, has far less to go through in that bottom lane. So they committed a lot to it. We'll see if it pays off in the long run. Well, that's the thing about Battlefield of Eternity is that you really are limited to taking fights past the Immortal as a means of ensuring that you don't fall so far behind that you don't have to give up future Immortals and just slowly, by pure attrition, lose the game. But even with that, no tomorrow, there is that structure damage that was uh, wrought by Goku on that uh, blaze while no tomorrow was trying to get that kill, which they did get. And Octalysis is sitting pretty at more than a level ahead in experience, hoping to get that four. 
which will mean that the next Immortal does so much more and get them closer and closer to having 10, so they have the better setup for the next Immortal. Yeah, I want to take a moment to try and explain why the difference is. Had Dahaka stayed bottom, there's no way you get that push in. As we see Jay Shrite going in deep. They just need to. They have they to keep fighting. They are getting on there. The armor, not enough. They do have to keep fighting. And so they're making things happen. That gives them a decent chunk of experience to come back upon. But if there are minion waves in that lane, you cannot siege up on that. They had the next wave of minions already prepped. That allowed them to siege Didoc Talus's. End up giving up a kill at the tail end of that. They do still find themselves at level 10 quite a bit quicker than No Tomorrow. No Tomorrow have this camp, and ideally, you give it room to keep the siege going. But with 10, that is scary times. Jay Shritta with a face full of fire, and Goku's going to keep him there with a great jet propulsion flank already coming down after getting the camp with the 10. Knowing that if No Tomorrow stick around, this is a prime opportunity to start getting some kills done. That's the primary race, oh. race hero, and then this happens. Jin just landed a money storm bolt because that would have been a dead Murden in any other circumstance. And the fact that he smacked him right in the face with that hammer, he knew he was coming over the wall, had enough vision. That is timely right there. And he's able to walk away and that could be enough to counter a snowball in this circumstance. Had Murden gone down, this could be even worse right now. Yeah, because No Tomorrow need to get 10 and fight with it immediately. They have no time to waste. And this is a rough one. It's back to the safe attacking positions of the Immortals. They've got to force Prismaticism away from that. Casanova does that, but he's shoved in. Tomster is going to come in too, and No Tomorrow diving deep into enemy lines, hoping to get this fight started. Tomster a lot of that damage. Justin on the prowl there on Diablo, continuing to move forward. In this position, no tomorrow, I don't think, can afford to back off. There's going to be a shadow charge in. Yeah, they keep wanting to flank around to Prismaticism because they know he's going to try to come through one of two oh chokes. But this lightning breath in the choke point is to the demise of Murden and Malfurion falling to worst case scenario for no tomorrow. And now Tomster, he's under assault, going to burrow under, but it's all for naught as Draded helps clean that up. They're trying to get any amount of damage they can with Casanova and Shrite on the right, but the real damage is here on the left. Octalis is knowing that this camp will be pushing bottom as well. We'll see if the next Immortal is gonna be down on that. So Top did take some damage at some point. So that's gonna move towards the bot lane. So supplementing this camp with the Immortal. Scary push now, especially with a Sergeant Hammer behind it. It's a critical moment for No Tomorrow, but you can see the setup for a flank around the side with Jen and also Greymane. There's places to sock in too, and this is the same situation as before. You have a narrow window before your opponents get a talent to your advantage where you can try to fight behind the Immortal. The focus thus far has been on Prismaticism. There's the Storm Bolt from that, adjusting with such good peels. Now there's going to be the stun. The follow-up bunker is down quick enough Shrite has fallen, Bud's life finder is out. Jin is going down. Tomster will fall shortly after, but right now Akafe's doing a good job keeping him alive. And I think this might actually be enough for game as Octalis is trying to close this out. Not gonna let their foot off the gas the same way they did in Towers. Going directly to core, shield starting to fall. Immortal still very healthy. And this is gonna be Octalis is closing out the series against No Tomorrow. Showing us just why, although Octalis hasn't picked it too much in their series this phase, they can return to Battlefield of Eternity and still be able to close it out quickly, making the right calls and bringing back the Li Ming and Sergeant Hammer composition, proving that they're able to get execute wins along with it. It was clean. Mm -hmm. Sergeant Hammer at level four, not too shabby, and Life Binder showing again why it's so strong. The coordinated assault was there, but I cannot do any more complimenting than I possibly can of D Diablo and Justin. The amount of zoning that he did, he was the primary target every single time. He knew how to keep his teammates alive at every corner of this. The charges he had were impeccable. And I think that last fight really showed how strong he can be on the front line and allowing that team to work. I said it last week, I'm gonna say it again. I don't think he needs to be the primary playmaker that he tries to be at times because he is so strong in his role. He's almost too good for his own good. And when he plays around that control and allows Prismat and Draded to do what they do, which 
over the last few weeks has been pretty strong, they look like a much better team. Well, Octalis has only lost one game in that series, which still gives them a fighting chance for the Western Clash. And it is going to be a photo finish, guys, which makes next week and the rest of this weekend oh so exciting. And talking about Endemic, Team Freedom 2, and the match that is not only Endemic as they're trying to take on Tempo Storm, which we're about to see in the next match if they truly are the top team in North America, but also that Freedom and Octalysis face off in the very last weekend of Part 1 is truly exciting. That could determine so much, not just for both of those teams, but potentially Endemic as well. Endemic might hold their own fate in their hands against Tempo Storm, who might go in next weekend as number one or number two, depending on how today plays out. So lots of major changes in the next week plus. I think that's kind of what makes it exciting going into the clash. Four teams going each. You kind of wish it was five. You kind of wish it was six because there's so much talent between EU and NA right now. And there's only four teams that can make it from each. So it's going to be exciting. Well, I am also very excited that No Tomorrow came in and played how they played. They had uh, some fantastic punishment and multiple games. Also felt like they're drafting for Jin to just come in this weekend and them decide. Jin is going to be drafting for us. He did a great job for them. They looked good. They got a win on Octalysis, and I think they have a lot that they can uh, look to you know, improve on with those improvements that they have shown this weekend. I'm really curious. The Alex Straza countered all of these Genji dies. Mm -hmm. Genji, 0-3 for no tomorrow. And it's not because Genji didn't look strong, it's just Alex Straza kept showing up on the other side with Life Binder. If you take Alex Straza out of the equation, do those games look different? If so, how much different? Because no tomorrow, they executed their draft well, and their draft was definitely better than we've seen in the past. But Alex Straza on the other side was so strong, Gilly. Like, I don't know what they could have done terribly different. Obviously, there's a lot of things you can do different in every game. But they focused. They had the right targets. It just didn't work out. And it was countered very well by Octalysis. Yeah, the, the changes to Alex Straza in Life Finder alone seem to be some monumental differences for this hero, considering the fact that, you know, yes, there's a third ban, but it's been quite the difference to see with her. But I do believe uh, Prismaticism is ready, and I think maybe we can ask him about uh, that, as well as how he's feeling. Hey, Prismat, congratulations. You guys get a 3-1 win over No Tomorrow. Uh, were you guys expecting how No Tomorrow to play how they did today? Uh, I think they actually played a bit better than expected, mm -hmm. but it might also be us underperforming still. We have issues we're still working through. Uh, hopefully we'll be ready in time for Western Clash, assuming we qualify for that. Yeah, so uh, last weekend, maybe not going to plan, losing to Endemic. Um, what did you guys do after that difficult loss to kind of regroup and make sure that you came in strong this weekend? We had a couple of team meetings just to overall figure out what our plan going forward was to work through our issues and just uh, set like a goals and a plan going forward to make sure that that kind of a thing doesn't happen again and to improve. Well, you and Drated have been such an awesome backline to get to watch grow together. Um, your numbers are among some of the top in the world statistically, so keep on going. Uh, what's it like working together and how have you guys been building that synergy together? Because we see you guys play a lot of stuff and be very flexible um, working some heroes back and forth between the two of you. Uh, it's been good. Drated overall is like a really consistent, just good range player and flex player. So we just work together. We call our targets, focus the same person, just win team fights. Well, that sounds like the right game plan to do because you guys won today. Congrats again. Jay, how many questions for Prismat? Yeah, Prismat, you guys have had the largest hero pool or one of the largest hero pools, not just in North America, but globally. And we know that you guys have a lot of flexibility within your drafts. Does, do you feel that the extra ban now coming in, because you guys were untargetable, it seemed like, going into a lot of the series, does that just make your team even stronger that you can target other people and still be untargeted? Did you feel that effect with the third ban this weekend? Uh, I don't think we felt it too much this weekend. Overall, I think there's more like role focus on the bans, and it lets you control like what role gets what. And I do think there are a lot of players in North America that do have exploitable hero pools, especially with this extra ban where you can, you can just ban out two to three heroes from their hero pool, and then they can't play anything, and you just you just have a 5v4. Well, Gilly brought this up a little bit between you and Drated. We've seen the flexibility. One of you goes to melee one game, the other goes to melee the other game, and it just kind of seems to be a mixed bag. And for me, last week, and I was talking about finding you guys' identity between that backliners, because when you two are back there, you're strong. 
Is that part of the discussions you guys had this week is identifying what you want to accomplish in those roles? And did you find it this weekend? I think it it's mostly just hero dependent. I think the only melee hero I'm probably going to play is Malthill. But uh, the rest of it are just his. But it's just a, a hero that I'm good at and that I had practice on from before when I played offlane. And the rest is, is his hero pool. Well, going back to know tomorrow a little bit, we heard from, I actually heard from Akaface that Jin was going to be their drafter this week, and a lot of people know that Akaface has been their drafter. It seems like they had a clear strategy, and at times it worked really well against you. Alex Straza, it felt like, countered a lot of their dive potential. Do you feel that this is a good step for them, despite, you know, dropping you guys 3-1? Did it feel like a better no tomorrow this weekend? You said it was better than you were expected, but did it just draft-wise and execution-wise feel different? Uh, their drafts definitely seem a lot more consistent, a lot more like reliable and solid. Game one, uh, I think they won the game mostly off of draft two, just a draft advantage. So, yeah, they're looking a bit better, yeah. Well, obviously, there's a lot to be determined before we figure out who goes to Western Clash. You guys still in that, so congrats on the win today. We'll look forward to you guys next weekend. Thanks. We'll all ask about it. You guys have one match left before the Western Clash is decided, and that is a super important one. We can see your schedule here. It's all down to your match versus Team Freedom. Walk me through how you think that one's going to go. Uh, I think we should win it. Things are improving steadily. So we've got a week to repair, and I think we should win it. We should be able to. Looking at the schedule, is there any that you feel like you know, it, had it gone just a little bit differently, you guys would have had maybe an easier time of qualifying for the Western Clash? You want me to bring up the servers again, Gilly? No, we're good. <laughs> oh, we'll skip that one. <laughs> All right. I mean, the, the Tempo Storm series, yeah. that game, that one was very close. We had a bunch of mistakes and draft errors that made it a, a loss, and same with the Nemec. Mm -hmm. Both of those series were really close, and we definitely could have won either of those, and then just been 5-1. Five and one, five and one. Well, you guys are very close, so keep it up, keep rocking, and good luck to you versus Team Freedom. And if you have any shout-outs, now's your time. Uh, shout-outs to the Octalysis group, and shout-outs to my team. We're working through some issues, but we're all sticking together and trying hard and working towards the Western Clash. And also shout-outs to all the haters and the memers in Twitch chat. You really give me a lot of energy and a lot of drive to keep working hard. Thank you very much for joining us. Prismat, congrats again. Thanks. Pretty clear connection there. Mm -hmm. It's on good video servers. Mm -hmm. Optimal. Optimal video mm -hmm. servers, yeah. So for Octalysis, they didn't get the 3-0 that they wanted. They still get a 3-1, which puts them in a tie in that win-loss department, the ever-so win-loss department against Endemic. They're still down in the tiebreaker. So next weekend, there's so much to be determined with those two. I cannot wait to see how that plays out. But take a big step forward this week. I think a little bit of a hiccup in game number one. Credit obviously goes to no tomorrow in the draft, as Prismat said. So I think 3-0 would have been better for them, but difficult circumstances, see if they can hold up. Yeah, and that's props to know tomorrow for coming in and defying expectations, at the very least, Octalysis expectations in what, what happened with that series. And I look forward to the continued growth from No Tomorrow. I believe we'll get to see them again tomorrow, but coming up next, the capstone of part one for HGC North America. It's Heroes Hearth Esports going up against Tempo Storm. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back soon with that amazing match. Enough. So Justin finding a way to survive, and now Octalis is continuing to fight. Don't have to worry about mid. They have the camp there. Goku deep in the lines, as you said, has, does not have Ardent Defender and falls. This damage output between Jay Shruta, now that he has Paint him Red and Casanova is all stacked up. They find another target. This time it's going to be Drayden, who's flipped over into the middle of No Tomorrow. That's two kills, Jay How. It's going from bad to worse. Prismat tried to hit that. So he could jump over, but nice sidestep there. Take out the bottom fort. They still have a lot of this protector left. They're going to open up this keep too. This is going to be... Oh, no. Oh, my. Oh, things are going from bad to worse. Look, I know you need 16, but can she be in the top lane when Gul'dan is dead? That is your only range damage. Things are spiraling out of control. I have never seen in this instance a somewhat even game is dreaded. Ate a lot of damage. They still have the healing pulse. I've never seen a second protector get this much value before. Yeah, I was talking about setting up for your next protector, but now they're setting up to try to end the game. Ardent Defender did go out. Horrified too. They need to get some kills from this. They do take out Thrall, but Ural's also going to fall. These staggered deaths for no tomorrow. They're trying to make it through. Right back in on top of Tomster. Oh, Jin's going in. Swiss Strike follow up. 
There's going to be the dragon arrow, but the dragon in return as Life Binder is there. Buds, last rites is on him, but the heal. Buds is a god on this dragon of Alex Straza. And they go all in. Bud says nada. They stay alive. Buds proves me wrong. Casanova. Wow, Casanova is a god. Woo. Probably should do that. Jen's trying to cut off the joining up of this team. And this fight is happening on multiple fronts. Buds gets out of the cocoon, though, and with a salvo, Jen will fall. First kill there. Akaface wants to retreat to the safety of this forward camp of the bell tower there. Man, Casanova is trying and doing everything in his power to try to trade kills out for his team. It is admirable. In this position, no tomorrow, I don't think can afford to back off. There's gonna be a shadow charge in. Yeah, they keep wanting to flank around to Prismaticism because they know he's gonna try to come through one of two oh chokes. But this lightning breath in the choke point is to the demise of Murden and Malfurion falling to worst case scenario for no tomorrow. And now Tomster, he's under assault, gonna burrow under, but it's all for not as Draded helps clean that up. They're trying the immortal. The focus thus far has been on Prismaticism. There's the Storm Bolt from that, adjusting with such good peels. Now there's going to be the stun. The follow-up bunker is down quick enough. Shrite has fallen. Bud's Life Binder is out. Jin is going down. Tomster will fall shortly after. But right now, Akabe is doing a good job keeping him alive. And I think this might actually be enough for game as Octalis is trying to close this out. Not. Gonna